Okay, so we're in our last planetary boundary, biosphere integrity and ecosystem service, or I'm sorry, the, the planetary boundary is biosphere integrity. Um, we're gonna talk about the two ways that that uh, planetary boundary is um, measured in the planetary boundary framework. And then I also want to introduce you to this idea of ecosystem services, because it's very important um, in the literature on this topic. Um, so you read two things for today about this. Um, and both of them were really about these ideas of ecosystem services and also um, resilience, uh, which is a key theme that's going to come up in this as well. And um, for those of you who are majors in sustainability science, you've already been introduced to that theme because it's pretty important throughout sustainability. Okay, um, here's our goals and objectives that I've taken to posting um, lately. So we, the goal here is to understand the relationship between biodiversity and ecosystem service provisioning. But in order to do that, we really have to first understand biodiversity, um, how it's measured, how we can think about it across scales. And then this one's really key here. Um, your guided reading question number four was actually all about this, explaining how biodiversity relates to ecosystem structure. Um, and then this relationship between biodiversity, ecosystem structure, and ecosystem services. Um, were we to have class period, I love to bring in Jenga games and use Jenga to illustrate this. Um, so when we get to the slide where we're talking about figure two, um, which again, you had a guided reading question on, I'll bring us back to Jenga so you can figure out what the heck I'm talking about. Um, okay, so just again, here's our planetary boundary framework. There's our biosphere integrity. So we've been talking about it in terms of genetic diversity and functional diversity. And by the end of today, I want you to understand the difference between what those things are, right? So what do we mean when we say genetic diversity? And what is this idea of functional diversity? And why is it so hard to measure functional diversity versus genetic diversity? Okay. So this is another thing that I do when we're in class. I'm just gonna have you think about this for a second. Um, I'm not gonna have you take, um, I'm not gonna have you participate because I don't want your voices going into this. Um, but in, when we're in class, I um, will typically give you guys these little cards um, and ask you to work in groups to classify them into uh, different, different groups of living things. And for the most part in my experience, uh, you all take a look at this and you'll stick like the amphibians together and you'll stick your insects together. Um, sometimes you don't know what to do with a bird. Uh, often you'll know your mammals belong in one group together, right? Um, and in my experience, you tend to classify them just on your own according to um, the system of taxonomy that we tend to use in um, Western science, right? Um, however, the thing that, um, it doesn't really, it doesn't always actually work, um, to illustrate the point, but you could classify these completely differently, right? You could have like things that fly in a category together, right? Um, you could have things that jump in a category together, uh, things that live in treetops in a category together, right? And so there's actually a diversity of ways that people um, this is an anthropology topic, but people um, classify organisms, living things, and we have a tendency, um, there's been a lot of research that it's probably something to do with our brain structure, but we have a tendency to classify things. Um, but how we classify them has varied greatly um, throughout uh, cultures. Now, in um, Western science, we came up with a system which is essentially Linnaeus classification system, right? And this is what you would have learned in life science um, and if you took any biology um, in high school um, or even probably bio 101 here. In fact, a lot of these slides are borrowed from a biology professor um, in the biology department for their non-majors bio class. So I know some of these um, concepts are repeated over there. But you would learn this um, classification system, which is your, um, you have domains, right? Which is, uh, these are your domains, the bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. And then you have your kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species, right? Um, so you might remember the kingdoms being like fungi, animalia, plantae. Um, within animalia, we have the arthropods, we have the um, nematodes, and different phylum there. And so as you're moving 
Um, so this is the broadest category, right? All living things. Then we move into these domains, which are these sort of um, based on cell structure. Um, what are the different class classifications of living things? And then we move down to kingdom, right? So that's a very broad category. All animals are put in the same kingdom. And then moving on down to phylum, we're becoming more and more specific until finally we end up with the genus and the species. Um, and so humans are the genus Homo and the sapiens species, uh, I'm sorry, the species sapiens. Um, and we actually are a subspecies of our own species, which is sapiens. So we're Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, and there are no other living members of our genus on the planet. Um, so we're the only ones. Um, but if you remember way back when I was showing you the slides of human um, evolution at the beginning of class or at the beginning of the, this course, um, I pointed out a bunch of other humans that have gone extinct in our, um, in our genus, right? So I pointed to Homo erectus, um, uh, Homo neanderthalensis, otherwise known as what we often commonly will call the Neanderthals. Um, right, and those are other uh, species that were within our genus, but now have um, gone extinct, right? Um, and I should have reviewed all this before uh, class, but our family is primate and then moving on up, I can't remember. Um, so this is how we classify all living things. Um, and we group them according to characteristics but we also group them according to genetics. Um, and the genetics are newer. We've only been able to map genomes for, I'm gonna throw out 30 years, um, maybe 40 years. Um, and it's only been very recent that we've gotten good at mapping genomes. And we do it quite efficiently now in the last, um, you know, I guess it was around the turn of the millennia when we get started getting really good at mapping genomes quickly, right? In the 90s and then into the 2000s. Um, and so uh, those are the two ways that we place um, living things in these different uh, categories. So this is our tax taxonomy. Um, and again, this is our Linnaeus classification system. Okay, so going to the most specific level, there's this idea of what is a species. Because when we're talking about biodiversity, we're talking about the diversity essentially of species on the globe, right? Um, so we have to think about what a species is. Um, and there's, it's actually not as easy as we think. In high school, you probably learned um, the next concept that I'm gonna show you. So this is a morphological species concept or organisms that have distinctive set of characteristics. Um, but that can be really tricky. Uh, and so we've got this other idea, which um, is gonna have to do more with our genotype, right? So this is our morphological species has to do with a phenotype or what things look like, right? Um, so if you notice, all of these butterflies kind of look similarly, um, but they might actually be different species, we don't know. Um, and that's where genotype is really critical, right? So um, our genotype is our genetic composition. Um, and if you took biology in high school, you would have seen some of this before, um, right? Because this is this idea that we might have, um, this is the idea of, uh, you can have genes that express a certain phenotype. Um, and so this is showing you a gene for a coloration. This is just a hypothetical. So you could have, if you have two of the same um, alleles for this genotype, then you're gonna have a dark coloring. If you have two different alleles, um, then you're gonna have also a dark coloring. This would be actually a dominant um, gene expression. And then if you have two recessive alleles, you're gonna end up with a light coloration. Um, and so this would be, again, a recessive characteristic. And we can see this with things um, in humans like eye color, um, hair color to some degree, follows the, this sort of pattern of gene expression. And so the point here being that um, to borrow like hair or eye color, you could have brown eyes, but actually have a gene that is for blue eyes, right? Because blue eyes is actually just the lack of expression of a protein. So it's really just means that you're missing a protein. So you have um, one of the proteins here, so you're still making that coloration. Um, and if you lose both of them, then you stop making that color altogether. And what we see is blue eyes, okay? 
So this is just a very, very basic overview of the idea of the difference between genotype and phenotype. And the reason I want you to understand this is because it's important to grasp that um, when we're talking about uh, biodiversity, we're talking about um, different diversity in both of these things, right? Um, what is the diversity in the genetics of these species? Um, because the genetic diversity is ultimately going to be really important in terms of maintaining the viability of a population of species for a long period of time. Um, and then phenotype, um, you know, the diversity of what they look like, uh, but also really the diversity of behavior. And that's going to get into our functional diversity that I'm going to talk about in a minute, right? So what is the diversity of kind of the genes that um, organisms are carrying? And what is the diversity of, their, uh, of what they do um, and how they look? <laughs> so this is a nice picture of dogs that would actually have a very um, similar, uh, they're both the same species, right? But they look extremely different. Um, okay, so back to this idea of what is a species. This is um, probably the definition that I would guess and maybe hope that you learned when you were taking life science or biology, um, which is this idea of a group of related individuals that are potentially capable of interbreeding. Right. Um, so sometimes, um, as you all know, I used to teach high school biology. We would talk about the example of uh, the donkey and the horse. Those can interbreed and create a mule, but we still consider them to be separate species because a mule is sterile. Right. Um, a mule is not actually able to go ahead and produce more mules. So we consider that to not be successful reproduction. Um, here's a couple other definitions. Right. So a single lineage of ancestral descendant populations of organisms, which maintains this identity from other such lineages. And then this one, um, there's uh, the ability to successfully interbreed, right? So those are really key. Um, these are key concepts of what a species is. And the reason I show you this diversity of concepts, because again, like anything in science, um, we're still learning more and understanding better what we mean by things like species and speciation um, in terms of biodiversity. But this is sort of our best understanding. Okay, so why might a species not interbreed, right? Um, you can have things such as, um, uh, there's these, these ideas called reproductive isolation. Um, and if a species becomes reproductively isolated for long enough, the idea is that eventually, it would become a new species. Um, and we've actually seen this recently. Um, scientists were able to document speciation happening um, in our famous Galapagos. So you might know, um, have heard about the Galapagos Islands. These are off the coast of Ecuador, quite a ways off the coast, um, but they are part of the um, nation of Ecuador. Um, and they have this kind of amazing um, rare diversity. Um, because the, they're, uh, if I'm not mistaken, they're 500 miles off the coast, so they're pretty isolated islands. And the animals that have that ended up there um, went over went um, speciation across these different islands, right? And so Darwin, um, Charles Darwin, the famous naturalist that came up with the idea of natural selection, which greatly contributed to our understanding of the theory of evolution, he actually went to um, he went to the Galapagos on a, um, he was like a passenger on the ship. He was a wealthy um, nobility and he just had some spare time. So he went as a passenger on his friend's ship um, called the HS Beagle. Um, and when, and he was in kind of a self-proclaimed naturalist and he was taking lots of notes as he was traveling around. And he started noticing um, that there were these peculiarities of these finches that were um, on these different islands of the Galapagos, and they seemed like they were almost all the same species, but they had slightly different beak size. And they were reproductively isolated um, because it was not that easy. These are, you know, they look kind of close together, but see, you can see here, um, you know, going from uh, Isabella to Santa Cruz, we're talking about like about 500 miles, or sorry, 500 kilometers. So it's not easy for a little finch to, get, to hop across from one island to the next. Um, and so these finches would get isolated and their beak size would start to evolve to um, adapt, or, or rather the ones that were surviving were the ones who had the beak size that was adapted to the size of the um, 
the seeds on the of the plants that were dominating the island. And so these are called Darwin's finches, um, and they've actually still being studied today. Um, and so you can see these differences. Here's some of the differences of the Darwin finch, right? So we have the large ground finch, the medium ground finch, the small tree finch, and the warbler finch. And Darwin posited that all of these had a common ancestor because they were so similar, um, but that their beak size had um, evolved to adapt to the different characteristics of the islands, right? And a key, uh, key aspect of this um, evolution in the speciation is our reproductive isolation, right? So in this case, they were isolated by being on these different islands, but you can also get things such as um, behavioral um, and breeding isolation and mechanical isolation that basically, um, for different reasons, populations can stop being able to interbreed. Um, another example of would be behavioral, right? Um, you can get a population that adapts to being diurnal as opposed to nocturnal, and then they would stop interbreeding just because of um, uh, that kind of behavior, right? That one's living during, or one's awake and active during the day and the other one's awake and active during the night. So there's lots of reasons. Um, that speciation starts to occur, but usually there's some sort of geographical isolation that happens as kind of an initial event that begins the process. Um, so this again, this is an abstract that I, I'm not gonna go over because we're gonna run short on time, um, but that actually uh, they, they, I'm gonna just look at that last line here. Um, this was a paper that came out only um, a couple years ago that was essentially showing that in only three generations of these uh, finches, they were able to show um, that there were that these finches were developing reproductive isolation. So um, they've actually, with some of these evolution studies, they've been able to um, chart evolution of species in relatively short time frames um, or key moments of the theory, such as reproductive isolation. Um, also with smaller organi organisms, so with bacteria, um, we can see evolution in real time because they reproduce so quickly. Um, and in fact, our examples of um, um, antibiotic resistance is real time evolution happening, right? Where um, bacteria are evolving to be resistant to um, antibiotics uh, through this process, right? Of, um, of uh, those who, are most um, adapted to an environment of high antibiotics survive and then um, pass on those characteristics. So you can look up that paper if you want. Um, this is another paper showing, um, I just thought this was kind of cool because it's showing the subspecies of giraffes in Africa. So um, looking at these species, right, um, to be honest, if I were just to look at these species, these species, I'd say, yeah, they're all just one big giraffe. They look the same to me. But in fact, we have these um, separate patterns um, or these distinct phenotypes on the giraffe um, and that uh, all of them relate to the subspecies of giraffe that has been in some way or another geographically isolated um, across the continent of Africa. Okay, so I've been going on about species and speciation and kind of a super rapid crash course in evolution. And um, all of this is, the, the quickness of that is because I, I expect this to be mostly a review. Um, so if you are lost on some of these concepts, that's okay. Um, just save those questions for the end of class and we'll see what we can go over in a little bit more detail. Um, uh, because it's been my experience um, in, in teaching this topic, less so at Furman, but more when I um, taught somewhere else, uh, that sometimes your high school doesn't really teach the concepts. There are, there are places that aren't teaching these concepts very much. Um, so if you're just like, what, evolution? I've never heard of that. We can go over that in a little more detail. Um, okay, so uh, biodiversity, the idea of biodiversity is that we have, it's the total of biotic variations, so living organisms variations from the level of genes, right? So within a species having genetic diversity all the way up to across ecosystems. Okay, so we have genetic diversity, species diversity, ecosystem diversity, right? And then um, ultimately you're gonna have, you know, biosphere diversity across the landscape, right? So 
Here's my example of genetic diversity. So you can have one rabbit population of one species that has lots of different genes um, expressed inside that population. Now, why do we care about genetic diversity of a population? Because if you have genetic diversity and there is some sort of disturbance to the population, it is more likely that that population will survive the disturbance if they have a diverse genetics, if they have a diverse genome across that population. Um, and the reason for this is because across the genetic diversity, you're going to have a diversity of traits. And those traits or characteristics of the individual organisms, um, you're gonna have more of a likelihood that some of those organisms are able to survive in the face of a disturbance, right? Um, and a classic example of this, um, sadly, given our current uh, situation, would be a disease, right? If a disease were a disturbance, um, when you have a genetically diverse population, there are some people who will be predisposed to be more immune to that disease than others. Um, and every disease that we've ever encountered as a human population, um, we have across the population some people who are naturally immune to that disease, right? And so if you have a diverse enough genome, you, you know, and again, um, it, it, as, as humans are a bad example of this because we have um, such great medicine and other ways of sort of, we don't only rely on genetic diversity, but if you're a rabbit, <laughs> right, um, and a disease hits your population, probably the only thing you have to survive is that um, the diversity of genomes so that some of those rabbits will go ahead and survive and be able to reproduce and their offspring will be resistant or more resistant to that disease, right? So that's the importance of genetic diversity in a population. Um, and, and it is important to understand that because we're talking about biosphere integrity and biosphere disruption. Um, and uh, our next topics are gonna have to do with um, extinction and a huge contributor to extinction is a decrease in genetic diversity um, across populations. Okay, so then on the next level, we're gonna have species diversity in an ecosystem, right? So not only do we have rabbits, but we also have birds and snakes, et cetera, et cetera, um, different types of plants. And then across an entire region, we're gonna have um, community and ecosystem diversity across a region, right? So. Um, do we have different communities of organisms living in a landscape? And then do we have different types of um, ecosystems across either landscape or entire bioregions, right? And so that's the idea of different levels of diversity that we might have on the planet. Um, and I just went through this in detail. So this is just a zoomed in slide when I presumably was going to do that. <laughs> um, okay, so how do we measure um, diversity? biodiversity. And this is a tricky thing. Um, uh, in the tropics, for example, um, in Costa Rica, we talk about how Costa Rica houses 5% of the world's biodiversity. Um, and that's great, but we only know that because so many scientists have been to Costa Rica measuring biodiversity there as opposed to other places in the tropics. So um, it's possible that we just have more described species right, in, um, in Costa Rica as opposed to in, let's say, neighboring um, Panama, right? Um, and so it's a little bit difficult, it's a little bit of a guessing game, um, how much of our, uh, how much biodiversity there is on the planet, right? Um, but this is what the type of thing that biologists might do in their profession, right, if they specialize in um, understanding uh, the diversity of a specific species. Um, and then here just is also showing you that there are some species, I'm sorry, there are some, um, these are different, uh, well, that we have, we have a different kingdom here, but then these are different, um, uh, we have our insects and then arachnids and plants. So these are, some of these are different phyla, some of them are different kingdoms. Um, but if you see, we have like a lot of described species of insects, right? And then quite a few of plants, but we don't have very many described at all of our viruses, and this is old, right? Um, and so there's a lot we don't know about the diversity of viruses and bacteria and nematodes, which are roundworms, um, as compared to, let's say, insects, right? And so um, the point of this whole, whole slide being um, that uh, there's, 
it's hard for us to measure biodiversity and it's even harder for us to chart um, when we're trying to understand biodiversity losses, we're understanding the losses of what we've already been able to document, right? Which means that there's probably a whole lot more being lost out there that we've never been able to document. Um, okay, so the way that we measure biodiversity, we talk about species richness and then species evenness. Um, so here's an example of the richness, um, species richness, right? which is just the number of species, the number of different species. So here you see one, two, three different species. And here you see one, two different species. So sample A would be a richer species or have more species richness. And then sample B would be more even, right? So we have, um, you know, you only have one little ladybug here and one dragonfly here and overall, this um, you have a dominant species here whereas in sample b you have um, only two species but there's more evenness across this population so those are two aspects of biodiversity that biologists try to understand okay so what is the reason that we get diverse populations communities and ecosystems and uh, um, the take-home point for you all to understand here is why we talk about things like biological hotspots um, and you know really critical areas of the earth that, that we, we need to conserve. Um, and it has to do with the idea of essentially what types of climates are most amenable <clears throat> to um, diverse speciation. Okay, so as you move towards zero latitude, you tend to get more species. And just a reminder from when we were talking about climate, moving towards zero latitude is moving us towards the equator, right? And so the, this is moving us towards our tropical regions. Now, why do we get more diverse species in tropical regions? Because it's consistently warm throughout the year. Um, so heat, uh, tends to um, lead to species diversity, right, within region, within re reason, um, particularly heat combined with water, right? So we know that water is essential for all life. That's why we spend so much time trying to see if we can find water on other planets, because if we can find water, it means there might be life there, right? Um, at least life as we know it. Um, and so watery, warmer areas tend to have more species. Um, and then also the number of species as you go up in elevation tends to go down. Um, and again, this is because as you move up in elevation, you have less access to resources. Um, in particular, um, uh, the concentration of gases in the atmosphere goes down. So for um, <clears throat> both uh, photosynthesizing organisms wanting carbon dioxide, and for um, organis uh, organisms that need to breathe oxygen, there's less access to that. You also tend to have colder climates as you move up in an elevation. So here you can see with every species, looking at trees, mammals, um, and birds, that as you move um, down in elevation, or I'm sorry, in latitude, you tend to get more species. Um, precipitation. So as you have areas with more precipitation and more water, you tend to get more species. And what this means is that we create what we call biological hotspots. I'm sorry, biodiversity hotspots. Um, and this is from a paper um, uh, back in 2005 showing us this idea that we have biodiversity hotspots, which are, are um, you can see in these darker red colors, um, that are concentrated across the globe. And the idea being that these are areas that have warmer, moister temperatures that are, um, for whatever particular character reasons, they have these characteristics, this combination of these characteristics that make it so that there's lots of species richness um, across these uh, hotspots. So conservationists um, tend to often want to focus um, some of their conservation efforts on these hotspot regions with the goal being to preserve the maximum amount of biodiversity um, in kind of a minimum amount of area. There's also lots of, um, uh, this is a contentious issue. Um, I teach a course on conservation and communities and this is an issue that we talk about a bit in that class. So should you be interested, um, 
I'll probably offer that in another year or so. Okay, so you can't turn to your neighbor because your neighbor is not sitting next to you. Um, but a f what are a few reasons we should care about biodiversity, right? And this has been a huge problem for um, conservation biologists because for a long time, they're trying to convince people that we should care about bio biodiversity. Um, and sort of like, I found your answers on the guided reading questions from Monday on ozone versus, um, this, this idea of ozone versus uh, climate change. And a bunch of you are like, well, ozone, it was so easy to care about it. It was so scary. I thought, wow, climate change probably seems, I mean, from what I know about both topics, I'd be more scared about climate change. Um, and of course they're interrelated, but uh, I think it's, you know, it, it's hard to really understand sometimes what makes people care about some things and not others, right? Um, so scientists have come up across this idea that they've really been pushing for the last 20 years, um, which is this idea of ecosystem services. And because people didn't care about biodiversity in its own right, um, they started saying, well, let's care about ecosystem services. This is the reason we should really, um, this is the reason that we should um, need to protect biodiversity. And this idea here, and this is moving us from the genetic diversity concept into the functional diversity con concept. So again, just reminding you that in our um, planetary boundaries framework, where there's genetic diversity and then there's functional uh, diversity. And this is kind of moving us from, and they're interrelated, of course, um, as I hope I illustrated in those last slides, but as we move into functional diversity, we're able to talk about these things like ecosystem services, right? So we have biodiversity and that's going to, um, sometimes we're gonna directly uh, extract biodiversity or use biodiversity in our lives, right? So um, food, fiber, fuel, uh, genetic resources, uh, medicine, for example, um, and pharmaceuticals really depends on the genetic resources of the planet. Um, and then there's also our recreation, our education, um, spiritual and religious values, right? But then biodiversity also contributes to these ecosystem processes, right? And these ecosystem processes create um, a different layer of ecosystem services, right? And so things like soil formation, regulation of water quality and quantity, provision of habitat, right? All of these things are services given to us by ecosystems that are um, functioning in a certain manner, right? And then these ecosystem services contribute to human well-being, right? So the idea being that, okay, fine, if you don't really recognize the value of biodiversity in its own right, you at least hopefully recognize that I like to eat peaches, and if there are no pollinators on the planet, I cannot eat peaches anymore, right? Um, and that's this idea of, uh, of pollinators being an ecosystem, um, being an ecosystem service, right, that's actually provided by these ecosystem processes and biodiversity. Okay, um, there's another concept out there, which is nature's contributions to people, right? So um, what it's really trying to get us to understand is that, um, that there's all of these ways in which nature contribute, contributes, sorry, to a good quality of life of people, right? So it's not necessarily that we're just getting services from these, but that it's actually um, wrapped up in our idea of sense of place and our cultural identity um, and our social cohesion, right? And so, um, and, and, and so we see this particularly, and in, in it's harder to sort of talk about for people who've grown up in more urban settings or even suburban settings, but um, if you talk with farmers and people in more rural areas, um, there's this idea that the ecosystems that we grow up in contribute to our physical and emotional health in a way of life, right? So beyond just this kind of instrumental, hey, we need these ecosystems to survive, there's this a little bit more of a um, mental, emotional health, uh, spiritual health associated with a sense of place and um, ecosystems, right? So all of this having to do with this um, uh, the biodiversity contributing to ecosystems which we interact with in a number of ways in our lives and depend on. Okay, so this is where, this is the figure from your, um, from what you read for today. 
And so I'm going to go over this in a little bit more detail now and then maybe grade it a little less carefully on your um, guided reading questions. So um, this was figure two. Um, and here's your uh, caption, right? Which, no, uh, I was going to mention something, but I'll mention it at the end of class. So the caption, the different components of biodiversity, right? That first part of the caption being more like a title. And then all of these components can be infected by human intervention and in turn have repercussions for ecosystem properties and services. Okay, so this is when I would bring out Jenga. Actually, I'd bring it out before this in a different class period, but um, this is why I bring out Jenga, right? Because the idea being, if you can think about Jenga as this game where you stack these blocks, right? When does it become like the hardest to pull away a block and um, keep the system from falling? when there's a lack of diversity at each level in the system, right? So if you have, let's imagine with our Jenga blocks here, like let's say you have two blocks holding up the next level. Um, oops, go back. It's easier to pull away one block and have a level balance with only one thing left there, right? And, it's, and so this is this idea of um, functional diversity and um, what we might consider the, um, escaping me, the redundance, the redundance of traits in an ecosystem structure. So for example, um, if you have um, a number of uh, predators that eat a certain population and you remove that predator, you're gonna have a different predator that keeps that population in check. However, if you only have one predator that's eating um, an animal at a level in a population and you remove that predator, you're going to get um, that population to kind of go out of whack. And that's what we've seen with the deer population in many of our temperate forests in um, the United States, right? We removed the wolves, the top border predator. The deer didn't have another natural predator um, other than humans in some cases. And so um, deer populations, particularly in kind of your suburban areas where there's not a lot of hunting, go wild, right? Um, and so this is a challenge, um, or that's just an example of the redundance of different traits that might happen in an ecosystem. So you're better off with an ecosystem that has kind of a diversity of traits and a, um, and, uh, a bunch of different species that are fulfilling similar roles, because if something were to happen to one of those species, another species keeps the ecosystem kind of functioning um, by performing that same role, okay? Um, and then at this level, we're showing the distribution. So you can have a diverse distribution of species, right? Um, and this is a diverse spatial distribution. Um, and that's important because if you can kind of imagine a wildflower, wildflower, wildfire sweeping through an area, you could end up wiping out an entire um, species um, if it's only spatially distributed in one section, right? But if you have kind of a more diverse spatial distribution, um, then you have more likelihood, you have more resilience um, within that ecosystem. And then finally, um, there's these ideas of, so relative abundance, right? So if we only have, you know, two little, um, species left here, um, and uh, it, you know we wipe those guys out. Now we only have this this one left, right? As opposed to this idea of if there's more relative abundance and it's more balanced across the population, um, you can have a diversity of functional traits. Uh, this one I find like a little less helpful. The idea of um, rectangles versus circles, but the idea being that. Um, uh, you can have different kind of um, uh, functional things that these species are doing across the ecosystem. Um, and then, of course, just the sheer number. You could have a difference in number of different genotypes, phenotypes, or species across the population. So the idea being that, um, you know, they here they talk about human intervention, but I, I want you to think about it a little bit more broadly because um, there's this idea of disturbance. And we, we sometimes think of humans as disturbers because we, we, we disturbed a lot of ecosystems on this planet, um, as we learned about in land system change. Um, but uh, even, you know, without, there's also natural disturbances as well. 
And so um, when you have more biodiversity um, and more diversity, uh, when you have more genetic diversity and more diverse populations and more biodiversity across multiple levels, you're ultimately gonna end up with more resilient ecosystems um, that are able to withstand diversity, uh, I'm sorry, disturbance um, in a better way, which ultimately means that they are more resilient to change. So remember that word resilience that we learned a long time ago in class, um, more biodiversity, more functional diversity may, makes for a more resilient ecosystem. Hey, so got only a couple minutes left, a few slides here on why ecosystem services are in decline. Um, main reasons, we have deforestation, um, we have uh, um, uh, agriculture, intensive agriculture, we have shifting to monoculture, right? So you all probably know about um, palm oil in the tropics and how it's um, contributing to massive deforestation. Um, if you didn't know that, it's contributing to massive deforestation in the tropics because palm oil is in so many of the processed foods that we eat. Not particularly good for you either. Um, and so it's contributing to a decline in ecosystem services across the globe. Here's a good sort of um, thinking question that asks you to combine some of the stuff we've learned about um, ecosystem services and um, distribution of ecosystem services across the globe that I'm just gonna leave up there for you to think about um, in a preparation moment. And then this last thing, um, again, we're talking about ecosystem services, but there's also this idea of uh, the intrinsic value of um, biodiversity, right? And that it having this, um, it, there, a lot of people believe that we should respect life for the sake of the value that life has on its own right. And so I took this picture of um, cool fluorescent looking caterpillars um, you see these guys in the tropics, um, and uh, I don't know what the purpose of this caterpillar is and how it contributes to um, the well-being of, you know, food chains or whatever, but it, it, it's, it's, it, to me, it has its value in its own right just as a living organism. Um, okay, so I can... Remember how to do this and stop the recording. <laughs>